Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so I will talk about some um, problems uh, from some long-term collaboration with uh, Christian Reyer and Wojtek Rödel, and uh, also with some students in Hamburg, um, uh, Simon uh, Piga and Sören Berger. And um, so these problems are more or less motivated um, by, by the work of Erdős, uh, Turan and Josh, and uh, that's why I put them on the, on the first slide. So maybe let's, uh, let's get started. So um, the, the history more or less um, starts with some um, paper of Erdős, which appeared in some proceedings uh, of some institute in Tomsk uh, in 1930. And the title is like this. So he talked about um, subsets of the integers with some forbidden structure, similar as we have seen in the earlier talk today. And um, so he proved some bounds. And in the middle of the article, you find uh, something like this, where he says, so really this argument was uh, not about uh, integers or anything, so it was an argument about graphs, uh, which don't contain a four cycle and an upper bound on the number of edges. And um, so for his uh, problem for the integers he was really interested in, um, he, he solved this graph theoretic problem and kind of essentially optimal. He showed that if a graph has uh, roughly k vertices and it doesn't contain four cycle, uh, then it has at most uh, k to the three halves edges, which is um, asymptotically optimal. And um, so I, I said, so, so typically, or at least, um, I mean, of course, I don't know uh, how Erdős was in the 30s last century, but um, um, usually the picture connected to him is that he always asked the general question. And, but in this case, he forgot, kind of. He didn't ask the general question, or it was just some toy lemma, which he noted on the way. And um, so that's why this type of results or question in this uh, area are not attributed to kind of Erdős type problems, but to run who was the first who proved a general result in that area. And um, the parameter he was interested in is the following. So you are interested in the maximum number of edges a graph on n vertices can have if it has some forbidden subgraph f, okay? And this is this extremal function x and f, so the maximum number of edges of an f-free graph on n vertices. And um, so this parameter is a little bit um, kind of, um, yeah, maybe hard to determine precisely because you run into some divisibility issues and so on. And somewhat uh, rougher parameter or more stable parameter is this so-called Turan density, which I denote by pi of f, where we just scale it to the appropriate density. So we are asking slightly weaker question if we ask to determine this pi of f. And um, so there are some results um, um, in the uh, 40s and 50s, which kind of determined this parameter in, in some way that uh, as from a graph theoretic point of view, we would say this is a very satisfactory answer. So the point is that the Turan density of a graph S can be expressed in, the, in terms of the chromatic number. Of course, so if you are not interested in graph theory, you might say, well, yeah, okay. So you have one graph theoretic parameter replaced by another graph theoretic parameter. So what's the point of this? But yeah, so, so the point of this maybe is that we avoid this limiting procedure. So in some sense, at least this parameter now becomes uh, com computer tractable. Okay. Anyway, so this is uh, considered the, 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 maybe one of the founding results of extremal graph theory. And as a consequence, it tells us, for example, what numbers are possible for these um, to run density. Um, so kind of, this is this discrete set, uh, which is possible. Okay, so that's maybe uh, this, the, the, the story for graphs. So then a natural uh, generalization is, uh, you may wonder what's, what's happening uh, for hypergraphs. So we are considering a uniform hypergraphs, which is kind of the natural generalization, just that the edges now don't have just pairs of vertices or are, two element subsets of the vertices, there are k element subsets. And I don't know, maybe then things look like this, right? So this would be a sample picture of a three uniform hypergraph. And uh, during my talk, I will, I will mostly focus on that. 
And of course, you can have the same definitions. And uh, here the situation, however, is much more uh, complicated or turned out to be much more complicated. There's one general result which tells you the degenerate cases. So when the Turan density degenerates to zero, uh, this is due to error from 64. It works for all uniformities. And it's basically, in some senses, generalization, which we have seen for the four cycle. So in general, if the hypergraph is k-partite, and k uniform, which just means that you can split the vertex set into k classes and edges just go across, then the to run density zero. And this, for example, also implies that there's some jump from zero. The next possible to run density is two nines, and in fact, it is two nines. Um, but it's maybe not so important for the rest of the talk. So maybe the takeaway is there are only few results. Let me at least mention one where kind of everything is known. And this is the so-called Turan density of the funnel plane. This was determined uh, by Decan and Furedi in 2000, um, just as a density question. And then a little bit later, uh, Furedi and Shimonovitz and Kibosh and Sudakov independently determined really this number for sufficiently large n, so much more precise answer. And they even tell, told you what are the experimental examples for sufficiently large n. And recently, Raya and Bellman, for example, brought it down and showed that this is true for all n at least eight. OK, so um, number of vertices, they really brought it down to the minimum number. But this is kind of an exceptional case. So this is a case where everything is known. And for most hypergraphs, not much is known. And so, yeah, so the favorite or uh, open problems in this community are um, the Turan density of K43 minus an edge, which is basically this hypergraph. And um, it's kind of fairly simple, but already this one is open. So there's a very nice iterated lower bound construction, which gives two sevens. And using the Fleck algebra method introduced by Rasparov, which makes these problems more amenable for computer search, um, with, with the help of computers, it was uh, this upper bound was proof, which is essentially the best known. Even more famous is, uh, and already asked by Turan himself, is this question for the K43 itself. So these are now the forbid um, four vertices with all four triples. And there, Turan gave a lower bound construction, which shows um, that this Turan density is at least five nines. And um, again, this black algebra method, one gets close, but kind of still, it's considered to be open. I mean, it's unresolved. OK, so what we uh, can do is, is this problem is kind of so difficult that um, only little progress um, happened over, over so many years. Um, one may study some variations. And um, what happens in um, these lower bound constructions here in both cases, basically, um, when, you, when you look at them, there will be large subsets where you have some holes where there's uh, uh, the density is, uh, there are no edges or, or much fewer edges than in the whole hypergraph. And so one natural maybe approach to circumvent this is just to enforce this as an additional condition and see, let's see whether the problem becomes simpler this way. And this is uh, what I want to talk about uh, today. And it's those things we then call uniformly dense, right? So these are hypergraphs, or I mean, one way to imagine them, these are hypergraphs. Business. OK, and um, yeah, so in the framework, just to be kind of, so we can then define something like the extremal number when we restrict to these uniformly dense host hypergraph. And then we can define in some way um, the appropriate to run density. And of course, since we restrict um, our problem, we get this trivial um, inequality. And in the talk, um, it depends how, how we go with the time. Um, I, I will introduce several notions of this uniformly dense. So it turns out um, the notion there are in hypergraphs, there are several reasonable notions how to define that, but we will, we will get to this later. Okay, so maybe before we talk about uniformly dense hypergraphs, maybe we should briefly um, go back to graphs. So what would be here a useful notion? And um, one notion which is studied a lot, and it's kind of closely related to the um, central concept in Samaritan's regularity lemma, is this notion of bi-denseness, let's say. So we say a graph has this density property. So P is the density, epsilon is the error parameter. If all subsets U and W, the edges across U and W is what you expect is at least P. And um, with some 
some error and the error just makes sure that you avoid trivialities and it basically restricts you that this information is only useful if you and W are linear sized subsets. Okay, so on linear sized subsets, we always have density at least P for bipartite subgraphs. This is how you can understand or how you should view this, this definition. In case you worry about what do you do uh, if U and W are not disjoint, so uh, let's say the edges in the intersection count twice, so that this formula makes sense. Okay, and then we may consider such a parameter, the uh, to run density for such by dense graphs. But then, if you if you if you think about it for not too long, you figure out that this will immediately be zero for all fixed F. So this property is strong enough to embed any fixed graph. And um, for this talk, actually, it doesn't matter for the main part of the talk, it doesn't matter whether you look at the bipartite version or the one set version. But uh, let me make one little detour, which kind of shows that there are some um, subtle differences when you are interested in the number of copies of F. So let me just uh, sidestep for a moment. So, what we have just seen on the last slide, I said, okay, so if you are uh, have this um, bipartite density property everywhere, then you can embed any F. And in fact, you can not only embed it, you get the right number, okay? So basically what is written here is that the number of copies of F, which you are in a guarantee to find in G, is kind of um, at least as much as if you would um, have a, a random graph of with edge probability P um, with, some, with some small error. Okay, so we get the way we should think of it in, in this bipartite density notion uh, gives us um, the property that we find the right number of copies of any fixed F and not just one as it was on the slide before. So a nice question which actually arose uh, uh, maybe in some discussions uh, when I was here 15 years ago um, is the same true if we just have the one set condition as an assumption. Okay, so this, uh, let's say uh, a graph is hereditarily dense, if on every subset you have density P, then it's hereditary dense with density P and some error. And is it true that this also guarantees you this number of copies? Kind of, it's an open problem. I couldn't resist to put, if you already talk about this notion. Okay, <clears throat> but, um, but for this talk, um, thinking about this notion or that notion doesn't really matter so much because we are just happy if we find one copy and this notion is also strong enough to find one copy in an easy way. For example, cliques you will find in the right number of proportion by just going through the neighborhoods. That's fairly easy. The problem arises when you consider graphs F, which are different than a clique. Okay. So now one uh, way to generalize this um, bipartite density notion uh, to hypergraphs, uh, the straightforward way is of course this one. Now you take three sets, uh, three subsets of vertices and you, you count the number of edges across and you want to have always a P proportion. And um, then we can define the largest um, kind of uh, density for which um, there exists hypergraphs satisfying this property, but not containing F. And this is kind of the natural two run density in this context. Okay, and just maybe for notational remarks, so these three dots uh, represent that we take three sets and sets are kind of one uniform object. So that's each dot represent one set. Okay. Now, of course, having um, seen that for, that for graphs, this, uh, everything becomes trivial. I first uh, have to convince you that for hypergraph, it, it doesn't. And um, so we need examples of weakly dense hypergraphs which don't contain some uh, given structure. And um, there's one old construction which goes back to Erdős and Heinel, uh, which is the following. So instead of defining the hypergraphs, the three uniform object directly, you first do something, um, um, you manipulate or the manipulation you take, uh, you do it on the pair level. Okay, and uh, what does it mean or what, what do you do here in this context? So you consider a random tournament on n vertices. So that just means you give every pair of vertices a direction. And, um, and then you take the cyclically oriented triangles and those appear with probability one quarter. And basically it's not hard to show that on every subset or on every collection of three subsets, you will have one quarter proportion of such triangles, okay? So this way, um, you get a hypergraph, which with high probability will be one quarter dense, weakly dense in the notion which we just defined a couple of minutes ago. 
However, it doesn't contain uh, K43 minus because if you want to find two edges, two triples on four vertices, basically the only tournament you can see underneath looks like this. So we have this triple, these two triples are present. Right? And this kind of is forced, um, basically, if you want to have two triples. I mean, you can flip all arrows, but this, this is all you can do. And now, basically, we are lost because there's no chance to find one more triple. Because no matter how I orient this pair, I already have a, a sink and I have a source. So there's no way that I find a separately oriented. So this tells us that this hypergraph is weakly uh, one quarter dense. It doesn't contain K43 minus, so something is happening. Not everything trivializes for really from hypergraph. And um, in fact, Trosh um, and Erdős conjectured in the 80s that um, this construction is essentially optimal. And this was verified a few years ago by Klebov, Kral, and Bollet, again using this uh, Black algebra method and computers of, of Rasparov. Um, one important thing for this talk, which I would like to point out, is that um, one naive idea when you study kind of hypergraphs with such a hereditary density um, assumption is that maybe you hope that this density is, is assumption is preserved on link graphs. Okay. And um, so the link graph, what is a link graph? You take a vertex and you look at all the pairs which complete this vertex to a triple. This is the link of this vertex. And maybe a naive idea could be if the hypergraph has a nice edge distribution, maybe the link graph has some nice edge distribution. But as we see in this example, it's completely wrong because all link graphs here are bipartite. Okay. So it's not that the links are uniformly distributed because I have to take my outgoing edges and my incoming edges and my link is in between these two sets. Okay, <laughs> another open problem I couldn't resist uh, not to put it here is uh, a kind of also due to Erdős, um, just by normal density assumption one quarter due to this example, uh, he was um, suggesting that maybe this is extremal for the situation that you have all links to be bipartite. So one more time, so if the density just without any hereditary assumption, just the global density is bigger than one quarter in a three uniform hypergraphs, and he conjectured that you must find <coughs> a vertex uh, which, which has an odd cycle in its link. And, um, and this is open and it kind of one of the, the problems uh, with this problem is that Kind of um, here we have some global assumption, but if we look locally at a link, not having a bipartite, uh, not having an odd cycle, it could have density one half. And kind of it's hard to bring these things together so that they force globally some 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 lower density. That's kind of maybe one of the big uh, problems or misunderstandings. Okay, so let me mention another uh, construction which doesn't have a K43. Um, of course, the, if you don't have a K43 minus, you don't have a K43, but this one will have the advantage that it is denser, it will have density one half, but we can maybe go a little bit quicker. So um, here we again, and this is the point I want to stress, we do something on the pair level. Uh, we consider the vertex that ordered, let's say it's one to N, we color the pairs red and blue. And now if I look at a triple I, J, K, where, where I is the smallest elements, I look at the two edges, incident, I mean the two pairs incident to i, ij and ik, and I put the triplet in if um, they have different colors. Okay. Now, again, the right link of every vertex will be uh, bipartite, but only the right link. So uh, only if I look to the right, the left looks a little bit wider, and I mean also across. Anyway, so um, this basically implies that it's weakly dense with density one half, but it doesn't contain k for three. And uh, basically, the reason is simple pigeonhole. So if we want to find a K43, there must be somewhere a first vertex. So this first vertex, second, third, and fourth. OK, so th those two pairs must receive different colors for this triplet to be present. But now, whatever I do with the uh, remaining pair incident to the first vertex, I will close the monochromatic uh, path of links two, and I will miss an edge. So um, this shows that this two run density, which we consider here um, for K43 has density at least one half. And, um, and yeah, so this is uh, uh, kind of maybe the, the most prominent and open problem in this area to show that this is believed to be optimal, I guess. 
Um, what I would like to point out is that um, this idea of manipulating the, the hypergraph by doing something on the pair level, which is then invisible by looking at all subsets of vertices, I mean, this is what we did by putting there something random. Um, this is the reason why um, in this hypergraph regularity uh, lemmas uh, by Gowers and Rudel et al., um, this pair level is taken into account in the partition, and this makes these statements more uh, technically more challenging. Okay, so that's why a lemma which just studies the hypergraph with respect to vertex sets kind of can never distinguish whether you find uh, a K for three minus or not in this density one quarter or anything, right? Because it cannot distinguish these situations. Okay, um, and um, so in these um, most proofs which uh, we obtained in this area kind of rely on the hypergraph uh, regularity method, but this is not just a side remark. So, Give me a couple of minutes just to briefly say what, this, what these lemmas say, and uh, for that, let's go back to graphs. So basically, what uh, regularity lemmas for Semiradis regularity lemma for graph from the uh, 70s says is that any graph can be partitioned into uh, a few vertex classes, a finite number, such that most of these bipartite graphs in between are quasi-random, so they have this bidense notion um, restricted to the bipartite pair, okay? And uh, this is true for most, those are the one which are uniformly shaded, kind of, we have some uniform edge distribution for these classes, but then there's maybe a few where we are irregular, so this can happen, but such a decomposition exists. And uh, so he uses, um, uh, yeah, in, in the proof of, uh, uh, of his uh, theorem on arithmetic progression. So this was one, uh, one tool or some earlier version of this lemma. And it turned out to be a fair, fairly useful uh, tool in graph theory and uh, to tackle uh, extremal problems. Now for hypergraphs, um, there was some idea how to extend it to hypergraphs, but yeah, so the, there's some straightforward notion where again, you just um, split the vertex set into some classes and then the triples will have this weakly dense notion, but this will never be strong enough for us to find K for threes or more complicated structures. So um, in order to circumvent that, you, you view again the graph, the hypergraph with respect to underlying graphs. So let me briefly explain what are the rough ideas here. So um, suppose you have a vertex set and on the vertex set you have a graph which has maybe triangles and then you view, you study the hypergraph with respect to the triangles of the underlying graph. Okay, so what does this mean? You have these triangles and you, you ask yourself how many triangles match triples of the hypergraph. Okay, and um, now um, this turns out to be some a notion of relative density. So it's the density of the hypergraph with respect to the graph, if you look at these intersections. And um, now you can say if you have a uniform distribution with respect to G, and then the following is true. Whenever you take a subgraph and you look at its triangles, then you have your close in density, right? Okay, so you have a graph G, which is given. Now you take all possible subgraphs, you look at the, how the hypergraph intersects the triangles of any of those subgraphs. And this, if this comes up always to be the same density, then you would say, aha, now the hypergraph is uniformly with respect to the triangles of the original graph. And basically what the hypergraph regularity lemma does, it gives you a partition of the pairs of the vertex set into graphs such that whenever you take three of them, then the multicolored version of this triangle density behaves well. Okay. But I just wanted to give some, some yeah, high-level overview of what this lemma says. So let's not let's not worry about it for the rest of the talk. And kind of the only the only thing maybe for you to take away from it is this kind of that this tries to circumvent these um, definitions where something, some structure is happening on the pair level because this allows you to detect it. So that's maybe I, I would like to leave it. Okay, so um, this lemma uh, kind of um, was used to get some uh, bounds on these um, multidimensional uh, versions of Samaradi theorem. And, um, and uh, yeah, so it, it also turned out to be useful for these type of problems and it appeared in some of these works, not in all of them. 
And uh, let me briefly say what can could be proof for this notion of this uh, current density uh, with respect to weakly dense uh, to this weakly dense notion. So the first result is uh, already some time ago due to Mumbai and Rudit. So they just show that there is a hypergraph F for which it's really different. Right? So that's kind of maybe something you would expect that this um, stronger density assumption for some hypergraphs gives you really a, a, a lower uh, to run density. Then we already have seen these results about the K43 minus. So together with, uh, with uh, Raya and Rudolf, so we could really prove this result without, um, without uh, the FLEC algebra by using this hypergraph regularity method instead. And we also could um, obtain an extension which is in line with this explanation when this parameter trivializes in the three uniform or in the hypergraph case. And, um, and this is a kind of a description or characterization when, when it becomes zero, which uh, can be viewed as kind of a, a generalization of this result of Erdős from 64, which I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. And then there are some other um, uh, nice results. So for example, this characterization uh, showed that there's a gap of two run densities between zero and one over 27, but it was open if one over 27 can be achieved or whether this could be pushed this empty interval a little bit longer. And this was uh, proved um, one or two years ago that there, in fact, is a hypergraph um, obtaining or having this two run density one over 27. And uh, uh, Matya, together with his co authors, for example, studied it for the tight, so called tight cycle case. And um, another result, which I would like to mention, uh, due to Balok. Klimen and Lidinsky, um, is he, he, they separated it, the traditional 5 9 problem from the one for the three dot notion, right? So here, of course, we conjectured or the conjecture is that the right answer is one half, but at least it's shown that it's really strictly smaller than one. Um, the nicest open problems, I think, in this, in this area is this one half problem. And uh, this, this construction of Rudel, which I have shown you, and kind of easily extends if you just use more colors for any uh, uh, clique. And then basically you get back the old two run densities from graphs, just shifted, right? So for, for graphs, the triangle two run density is one half and here it starts with the K plus three being one half and then you get all these uh, numbers of two thirds, three quarters and so on. However, let me point out, so this is maybe not so clear uh, if this is not a little bit too daring to, to believe that this is true because for example, for T equal to six, there are two, fairly different uh, constructions known. And so maybe this is an indication that, yeah, certainly there's a lot of things going on which we don't understand at this point. Okay, so I said, <clears throat> um, I wanted to, um, aha, so maybe, yeah, and this uh, would be kind of a, a nice um, result which would explain or which would really, um, explain the motivation for these type of problems. So I said at the beginning, that all lower bound constructions, which we usually know, they have somewhere a hole, uh, which can be described as a vertex set where the density drops. And if this is really true, then this would mean that in fact, this observation here, which was done for one hypergraph here, and maybe for K43 um, by the result of Balok et al, um, would be true always, right? So, I mean, except in the case when it's trivial already. And yeah, so it would be, of course, nice if eventually the theory would kind of allow such a, such a result. But it could be also that we are just overlooking other, other extreme constructions for the traditional problem. Okay, so this is maybe all what I want to say about this uh, three-dot notion. So let's a uh, little bit um, um, consider some generalization or how to generalize this. And these are... Um, uh, generalizations are very much motivated by the theory of quasi-random uh, hypergraphs. So where there are several notions uh, considered and they kind of correspond naturally to those. So um, one extension is the following. So, so we, the first notion which we considered is that we um, uh, uniformly dense with respect to vertex sets. And the second notion is just to replace um, these vertex sets, for example, you'd also consider some pairs, okay? So let's see, what, uh, what do I mean? So we have given a hypergraph H, we have a subset X, and we have a subset of pairs P. And now I measure density uh, with respect to P and X by looking at those triples, 
which are edges in the hypergraph, which are supported by one vertex from X and a pair from P. Okay. So basically I look at, at such things. And if I count these things correctly, then um, this is uh, maybe the way how, how it should be counted. And um, if I want to be uniformly dense, then I would say for any choice of X and any choice of P, I always get at least the same proportion of the number of all possible triples, which could be built by X and P. Okay. Um, this obviously is a, is a strengthening, a stronger assumption than this one, because if I just replace um, um, Y and Z by the cross product, then basically I get special type of witnesses considered here. So yeah, so this is how it could look in general. And um, this is what I just said. And yeah, so one way one can do this is maybe it's like a localized pair degree condition. So because I can consider these pairs and I can take an arbitrary set and then I know that most pairs have at least sufficient degree into that set. Kind of it's a stronger pair degree assumption. Okay, and for this notion, um, which um, we could show, I mean, first of all, you can show that this Rodel construction, which I, uh, I showed you, it transfers to this situation in the sense that it's also a lower bound for this type of notion. So it's kind of straightforward to check that this random construction will have density one half, um, even for this stronger concept. And, but however, for this stronger concept, we could, uh, we could prove that one half is optimal. So here we could get the, uh, the, the matching upper bound. And maybe this gives some, some more indication that this one half could be also true in the three dot uh, context. But um, as I said, this is still open. Okay, now, of course, it's kind of clear how to continue. So, I mean, of course, this notion is represented by a dot and an edge. Of course, on three vertices, you can also put two edges if you want. And then you will get such a notion and you can define it um, in a similar uh, way as we did it just a couple of minutes ago by just, you, you insist that for any two, uh, any set of pairs of pairs or any pairs of pairs. So you have a set of pairs P and a set of pairs Q, and then you count the triples sitting on the um, two colored passes, which sit on an edge of P and an edge of Q at the same time. But a nicer way to describe them is, uh, in fact, these are, um, this is equivalent to say that now we insist on this property, which we didn't have before, that the links of every vertex are by that. okay? And so this may be more natural to think about it. And that, let me put this up as a definition, right? So we would say a hypergraph satisfies this, let's say cherry density here, assumption. If the following is true, most vertices, or let's say all vertices have the property that if you look into their link, then this link has a bidense property, which we have seen before. So the links are one-sided quasi-random in some sense, right? So in the lower bound, they are bounded away from being empty. And, um, and for, this, uh, for this notion, something slightly um, yeah, maybe surprising <laughs> happened. So here we could show that first of all, this parameter grows much, much slower, okay? So here, if these are essentially these traditional two-run densities for KT or KT plus one, but now you can embed cliques of size two to the T. And uh, what was maybe a little bit stranger when, when we proved this, so we obtained lower bounds um, for some cases, and it showed um, that we got the right density for K4, for K6 up to K8, and um, for K11 to K16. Okay, so, so first of all, here it's not, not true. And more that for cliques of different size, you necessarily get different answers. At K6, 7, and 8, they have the same answer, one half. But um, the more kind of surprising thing is that we could settle it for some of these cliques, but then in between, we left some open, right? So you, maybe one would assume that there's some monotonicity to this problem. So if you can solve it for K6, you should be able to solve it for K5. At least this is how it usually went. Um, but here in this case, uh, this was not, the, or in this situation, it was not the case. And, 
And we did not kind of know for some time uh, what are the right answers. And these three cases are somewhat open. For, for larger numbers, we are lacking lower bound construction. So there we just have this upper bound and we don't even um, kind of, it's not really clear uh, what is happening. But up to K16, somehow it's a little bit, little bit weird that you, have, that you have to have uh, three things uh, open. So in some senses, um, inspired us or kind of forced us to look at these problems, even though they look fairly particular. Uh, so. And um, so for, for K5, we could eventually solve it. So there, as I said, so there's this upper bound, which just comes from this result because you get K8 at density one half. So this was clear. And there's a lower bound construction, which gives one third, uh, which I will show you in a, in a second. And um, this lower bound uh, goes like this. So again, uh, you do something uh, on the pair level. So this time um, we give this um, the number 0, 1, 2, mod 3. And we say an edge, uh, a triple forms an edge of the hypergraph if um, this equation is satisfied. So if you sum up the values of the, of the three pairs, it should be uh, one mod three. And then basically it's a two counting, uh, a double counting argument. If you, if you assume there would be a K5 somewhere, then you uh, sum once over all pairs and once over all triples. And then you see that you get a parity problem. And that's why no K5 can, be, can exist. And uh, what we showed is that this construction is optimal and we got a, a, a matching upper bound. So we improved the upper bound for K53, but this was surprisingly um, yeah, complicated. And um, so again, so it, it heavily relied on this hypergraph regularity method and we really had to analyze kind of holes in this situation, whatever holes are, but um, sparser spots in some, um, yeah, so yeah, it, it took some work. And um, yeah, unfortunately, um, this leaves it still open for K9 and K10. And um, of course, these guys have already quite a few edges. So I'm, I think just getting through the technicalities, it, it doesn't seem that, that this argument can be extended in, in some way to, to solve it. But on the other hand, having these two open spots between 1 and 16 is also a little bit frustrating. So I yeah, cannot avoid to think about it from time to time. Um, let me. Um, um, let me a little bit um, tell you um, some, I, some different idea uh, how to prove results for this stronger concept, um, which came up uh, during, during this work, um, which avoids this hypergraph regularity method. So of course, um, since we could detect many of these problems with hypergraph regularity, we thought, of course, this should be the tool uh, of choice. But at some point, these uh, PhD students convinced us that maybe one should not use it, <laughs> try something else. And um, yeah, it's, uh, surprisingly, um, this led to kind of uh, in a different proof of this uh, general 2 to k to the 2t result. And in the, in the first case for k4, the argument becomes extremely simple. So let me just, let, let's just show it. OK, so. Um, so how to prove such a result so that we just uh, see some idea how to use the property that all links have this uh, bipartite density notion. So the first thing which, which we already talked about is that in this situation, we find many cliques of, of a fixed size. So fix some T, which is basically one over the density. And um, so we assume that we have a hypergraph which has the property that every link has uh, has this um, bipartite density notion, the sum positive density D, and our goal is to find a K for three, right? So this is what we have to do. So whatever this D is, we fix the parameter T as one over D, and um, yeah, it's kind of easy to see that, um, or this is where I ask you this more general question, um, that the number of cliques is N to the T, or constant times N to the T of size. And then you basically um, do some simple averaging argument and say, okay, so then there must be a subset U and um, um, which, which, I mean, so, so we have many clicks, so we just uh, do it um, the other way around. So there's a subset U on C and vertices, um, which contains a clique. Uh, on on x1 up to xt, okay. 
Okay, so uh, so 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 one more time. So uh, we have many we have many cliques. Um, so there must be. Um, um, so now, I, so let me say say it one more time. So well, somehow I, I lost my search on the page. So this is this is trivial, and um, there must be one clique which is. Um, Somehow, what I what I brought here kind of uh, confuses me. So I, I rather want to find uh, I rather want to find uh, a clique uh, which is good uh, which is good for many vertices. Okay, so so that's yeah so that's what I meant. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> now I understand. So we have uh, we have that many cliques in every link. So there must be a subset of C and vertices uh, which has the same clique. Okay, so this is just a double counting argument which I want to do. Okay, so one more time, this is true for every link. So this means for every vertex in its link, I find that many cliques. So in total, this double counting, I find um, CN to the T plus one, just pairs, vertices, and such a clique. So there must be one clique, and this is on the vertex, vert vertices X1 up to XT, which appears in the link of every vertex in U, and U has CN vertices. So I kind of try to understand what I wanted to tell me here. Okay, so that's very good. Um, but now, um, since this link of every vertex has this um, has this um, uniform edge distribution, it goes the other way around, right? So for every xi, um, the link induces a subgraph of positive density on the set u, and this density will be again d, and that just means um, at some point, um, two of these vertices share an edge in u. Okay. So that means two vertices x i and x j they have a common edge in u because each of them has in its link a density d in the set u. So this is unavoidable at this point. This explains the choice of t being one over d. But then it's easy to check that x i x j u and v they just span uh, a k for three because all the triples are are present, right? So first of all. Um, the, the triples from u and v, uh, from u to x i x j, are here because x i and x j, they were in a clique in the link of u and in a clique in the link of v. And the other way around, u v is an edge in the link of x i and an edge in the link of x j. So also these two triples are present. And so it's this bipartite uh, structure is exploited. And this bipartite structure can be kind of iterated with higher densities to give a uh, a proof for larger cliques and kind of to get this upper bound, which I, which I showed you before. It will avoid the, uh, the strong uh, hypergraph regularity method, but however, it kind of needs some inheritance lemma, which we can only get by applying to this weak uh, notion of regularity lemma, where you just measure the regularity with respect to vertices. So that's kind of a, a trade-off uh, which we have in that proof. And um, it's it's more I mean it's more complicated than these five lines, but basically it's it's maybe a little bit more um, a little bit easier than than the original proof and and maybe this is ever too close. Right. So the only balance you wrote down with the original problem with uh, this kind of the, uh, uh, sorry, um, this comp these computational bounds. Do they have a feature that if I run my computer for longer, I can improve that number on the right hand side, or is that somehow a natural limit? Uh, I think no. I mean, so there are, there are. If you go, if you look over the over the years, there are some uh, improvements, and I think there are new better implementation for. Or things like that. So, which uh, which would say that um, this higher computer power, you could improve these bounds. <laughs> but it's conjecture is that 
in the limit, we would cover something arbitrarily close. No, but I know, yeah. So I mean, I think of these, um, so especially yeah, in the hypergraph context, these programs don't work so well. So in the graph context, um, they had more success. So there were uh, much more results, but in the hypergraph context, so already this, um, for the K for three minus, um, this program, which got this one quarter was kind of fair, ran fairly long. And the authors had some, had to spend some time to make it um, numerically correct. Kind of to ensure that it really proves proves the result. So I'm. It's so coming back to your question. It's not. It's not conjectured that these programs, if you uh, in the near future run them just a little bit longer, that they would solve these conjectures. Right, but then like that, we do think actually get arbitrarily close to the right answer, or if in the limit. I mean, yeah, that, that's true because I mean, I mean the the larger the finite problem you 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 solve with the computer the closer you get to the limit so if if the conjecture is true they would solve it yeah. is it none of these numbers rational um so if you i mean so there are there are some um some versions when you um, forbid not only one hypergraph but a family and then you can get uh, much more complicated answers and there are some, um, yeah, there are some also uh, irrational constructions um, where kind of uh, root two or something appears. Can you say, I mean, I'm not seeing, but the, where does this break if you want to do the single edge? I mean, you don't have a by dense link, but you can. Yeah, I think that's already the first thing. So you don't find a KT in the link. So it's only it's only for this kind of. Uh, I mean, of course, you may also ask. So why don't you put the whole triangle? But then you are basically at this uh, hypergraph regularity notion, which I briefly. Uh, um, back and then everything is trivial again. So here you have at least this um, quasi randomness or this um, uh, density notion on the link level, and below you don't have that. And that's why kind of the first step already. And or you would need some positive density in order to find that. Um, does it help to think of these as, as uh, hypergraphons or is that? I mean, excuse me. Is, if you think of these as hypergraphons, does that help at all, or does it make 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 no difference? I mean, uh, rather than having to run the hypergraph regularity very explicitly, if you shift the whole thing to an infinite free problem on the hypergraph analog of graph ones, then oh yeah. I mean, these hypergraph analog. I mean, that's uh, definitely possible. So they, they of course, these um, the limit objects are suddenly six dimensional. Like the hypergraph maybe in its natural way is more three-dimensional, right? Because you have to take the pair level into account. So you have these, uh, and that makes it kind of harder to overlay these structures, right? So in the graph limit case, it's very useful that uh, everything is two-dimensional. And here kind of you have this uh, problem. But in principle, you can, I, so I, I'm not aware of any problem in the graph limit case, which you can only prove on one of the two sides. So, I, yeah. Logically, it's somehow equivalent. Logically, it should be equivalent, and um, and um, here we kind of have to analyze these uh, what is called these reduced hypergraphs, and they still get some have some simpler structure, so that something something can be done. So uh, that's why we chose it in that way. Okay. Let's take Matthias again.